Hi guys, my name's Jack Nagel and I've been in recovery for over 10 years now and completely transformed my life out of addictive patterns. And with Real Drug Talk and our treatment company called Connection Based Living, I've helped hundreds of other people completely change their life as well. Like Haley, who's over six years in recovery, you can check her story out on our YouTube channel. And James, who's over two years in recovery now, you can also check his story out on our YouTube channel. Um, because of the mad times that we live in, uh, we have put together a book. It's called The 11 Definitive Steps to Transform Your Life Out of Addictive Patterns Without Having to Go to Rehab. You can find it by scrolling down in the description that I'm pointing at here. If you just scroll down and click that link, it'll take you to the special offer on the book. It's super cheap. Um, and also you get some free bonuses along with it as well. So if you're looking to transform out of addictive patterns and get some change and you know have things to be different and joyful and have some freedom in your life i'd highly recommend taking a look at this book it could be the most important thing you read um, in 2021 and 2022 moving forward um, into the video guys peace and i know you because i so when i was driving back from this whole debacle yeah i was listening to your podcast my mom sent it to me <laughs> oh, there you go. and i found it so um refreshing because it was a very similar situation. Like I'm very lucky, lucky to be born into a family that, you know, we went to a good school, yeah. had food to eat, like got to play soccer, had supportive parents that worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and so from the outside, it's like, well, there was, what is the, the cause of this um, addiction? 100%. But I think it's a whole number of things. And, and like, you know, only the person that's struggling with substance abuse knows truly what's causing it. Boom. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Real Drug Talk. Now, today is a pretty cool episode because we like having family members on the show. Uh, because as I was just saying to... Edwina, or do you go by the name Ed, or you got a nickname? I got Edie, Edie? Nina, Ed, not Edie's... Eddie though. Eddie. Okay, not Eddie. Like... Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Edie was it? I like that one. That's cool. Um, so yeah, as as I was saying before to Edie, uh, we we most of the people that listen to this show and the feedback that we get are family members. So uh, we wanted to have more family members' story stories uh on the show because um yeah i think it's really interesting and something that's kind of not covered a lot um so how are you mate thanks for coming on oh it's a pleasure anything to to spice up life in lockdown <laughs> that's right that's right so you're in um sydney is that right yeah yeah i'm in narrickville um in the like inner west bubble awesome awesome okay so you're right in the thick of it um mm -hmm. So uh, do you mind, so Edie's story, your name is, and, and you're actually a journalist, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I have been working my way through media, trying to get around the tracks for a while. I was at the ABC for seven years um, doing everything from explainers about sex to art documentaries, and now I am highlighting the stuff that pisses off the Australian youth uh, with junkie media. <laughs> love it. Love it. So very, very on top of it and probably have an idea of some of the cultural stuff that goes on anyhow. But do you want to just like quickly give us the overview of how you sort of got in contact with us and, you know, your story and, and some of that, some of that stuff? Because I think it's interesting because you've actually heard the podcast and we've been in touch with some of the other members of your family and things like that. Yeah, so I guess this all stemmed from, um, yeah, it stemmed from a podcast episode I made for Radio National. Uh, the episode's called The Long Way Home um, on days like these yeah uh, and right. so it kind of um the the podcast series in itself kind of charts unusual kind of life moments mm -hmm. and um I'd been asked to kind of contribute and uh, I was pitching ideas and then I was like oh, well actually this unusual thing happened to me recently and so this podcast is about um 
Do you, should I tell the whole story? Yeah, or? yeah, 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 yeah. Shoot, shoot. Okay. So I um I was up in the Sunshine Coast uh, being a journalist and stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> I uh, was working on a Saturday new shift um, and I got a call from my little brother. Yeah. Um, and our relationship, because of his struggles with substance abuse, um he we kind of my previous oh gosh our relationship had waned yeah yeah um I think it had been through so many twists and turns and over the last couple of years I had been trying really hard to get him into rehab so he'd have like he'd been doing um ice from when he was I think 17 but he would have to correct me um, and then he, yeah, he'd been to a couple of rehabs before, um, one which was funded, you know, in large part by Hillsong, which I have many thoughts about. Yeah. Um, yep. And, but yeah, and then last year during the pandemic, no, the year before that in 2018, I was trying to get him in to rehab because, I mean, as you know, he would have these windows of like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so I tried to get him in, but then the wait list was too long and it would always like the, the window of opportunity would pass before he was able to get a bed. Yeah. And so that happened in 2018 and 2019 and in 2020 as the pandemic was just cramping down on the world yeah. and um, he rocked up on my doorstep after having a hard time kind of living out of his car. Uh, it was April. So everything was burning down. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, now is the perfect time to go to rehab. There's nothing else to do. There's everything's turning to fire. So now is a great time. And unfortunately I just, just couldn't get him in the wait list. Like, and at that time from memory, um, the rehab clinics were sending people off to different clinics and locking down completely. And there was just nowhere to get anyone in. Yeah. And I think, well, here in Victoria, I'm pretty sure the same in um, New South Wales and all over the country as well. There were all the rehabs, which just made it so fucked up, even worse than it normally is. They were doing like half capacity um, to to fit in with like, you know, COVID stuff and whatever. So yeah, it would have been a nightmare. Yeah. And then, so, um, but that kind of window of opportunity passed and then um, a whole, bunch of unusual life circumstances occurred where I ended up uh in Queensland uh I had to move from Sydney and then uh after that like last stint of trying to get him in uh yeah we kind of we go through pockets of not really talking for a long time yeah um because uh often I would find he was just calling in for money really yeah yeah um because he needed help Yep. And so, and sometimes I had the capacity for that and other times I didn't. Yep. And, um, but then I'm on this Saturday news shift and I'm like making audio documentaries and shit. And then I got this call from him and um, I declined it because I was like, I, I don't have time for this at the moment. I'm on deadlines. Yeah. And then um, he called again and I answered it and he said, um, Edwina, I've got HIV. And wow. Just it, like straight off the bat like that? Yeah. Yeah. And then kind of broke down as you would. And he was in this, um, I could hear he was in just a hospital bed and there was people around him. He didn't have any privacy. And I was just like, it's okay. I'll come and get you. It'll be fine. Fuck. And he was in the Gold Coast. And so that's like two hours away. And then um, so I just called my boss and I was like, I can't finish any deadlines i this has happened and i got in the car and drove to the gold coast to get him wow and how would you describe like emotionally at that time like what's that like on the other end of the phone as a family member just hearing that you uh, yeah i couldn't imagine i was distraught yeah it was um it was scary because i also you hear about hiv but i didn't know and i knew it was an autoimmune issue but I didn't know I was like but what actually is it like what the fuck happens like I know you're okay now but what what does it really mean how long does it last like what what's the deal and so um I called my partner Claire who's a scientist and I was like well I need you to google HIV and blood (laughs) tests and all this kind of stuff and Claire was reading me articles as I was just like 
like hammering it down this motorway to go and get him. Um, and yeah, it was kind of scary because it was like, it's it like wasn't good news. And Claire had to kind of break it to me and be like, well, yeah, it's not great, but it could be okay. Yeah. Um, so then I went and um, collected him. And then it just felt like this strange brother sister relationship where it was like ah so how do you think you got this and what do we do next and I was just like I feel like we need to go home to mom and dad like I feel like yeah that's what that's what's that that's what you should do right now luckily it was in a, a window when the border between Queensland and New South Wales was open oh could you imagine <laughs> oh my god yeah but there was um it was a one in 60 year rain event. So the Pacific highway closed down. It was a fucking nightmare. It, what, wow. what would usually take 12 hours to get to Sydney took um, 30, 32. Yeah. And, but also I called so many people for help. I yeah. called friends who worked in um, HIV taboo research. I call like um, my partner, called their sister who called someone else to find out like where you go because um when my brother and I first found out I sat down on the Sunday morning after we you know had this night driving back from the Gold Coast because I did the two hours there got him and the two wow. hours back and as this like looming weather event was building up and then we got we sat down outside on the Sunday and it's like okay helplines who are we gonna call and we tried calling like I called Oh my gosh, I called Akon, I called Queensland Health, I called so many helplines, and they all just looped around in this like, the office hours are currently not in operation. Please yeah. call this other hotline. And then, um, yeah, it turned out there was this one clinic in Darlinghurst and called the Kirkton Road Centre, which is a lifesaver. It was amazing. Awesome. And we just belted it from Queensland to Darlinghurst. Wow, wow. There's so many questions I want to ask you out of all of this. So, okay. So I guess like, first of all, like, so you, you get the call initially and I want to go back a little bit before that as well. And sorry, everyone listening for me jumping around on the story, but um, like how hard is it as well? Like with these big drives, the weather event happening, like what was your, um, brother's like emotional state like as well and and was that hard to manage was he you know wanting to use drugs or was he just like in shock at that point in time or like where where was he at yeah I think he was he was definitely in shock there was this one moment where I so I belted it to the Gold Coast and um and parked out the front of these towering um, you know, there's towering apartment blocks. Like I hadn't been to the Gold Coast before and it's so strange in this rain with all the neon <laughs> lights and everything. And I, we got out in the rain and he just like dropped his bags on the floor and we hugged and he cried and I cried. And then we got in the car and he um, pulled out this Bundy and cola and he's like, do you mind if I drink this? And I was like, I feel like maybe you should eat something good and he's like this is all I have at the moment so um so went out to get food and sorry I'm get I'm getting caught in the weeds but he when we were driving back I was I kind of got angry yeah. and um because I was like I I don't know if I have the emotional capacity for this and it was just like I can't believe what's happening and I was like what do you think you should do and he's like oh go to rehab and I was like well fuck it do you even want to go to fucking rehab yeah because if you don't, then what the fuck is the point? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think he was he was really in a state of shock. And I was really defend I went like I don't think I was um I wasn't as a good support for him at that point because I was just angry yeah. and defensive and um yeah and, and uh, yeah, I like I uh, and I feel bad for being like that, but I was just like, well, what more else will it take if you still don't want to go to rehab at this point? Yeah. Um, uh, but he, luckily, when we got down to Sydney, he did manage, he he pushed to get into one and it was um, a lifesaver. It's funny that stuff, like, so 
it's it's really interesting because <laughs> I um even though I like sort of do this for a living and I'll like talk to families and try and talk them through like how they should approach their loved ones, all that stuff, right? Throughout kind of the years that I've been in recovery, I've had family members that have their alcohol and drug issues. And like, I must admit, I feel embarrassed saying this, but I've like been in the same spot, right? Where I've just been like wanting to fucking put them in a headlock or like just scream at them. Or I just think I'm not fucking talking to you because you're doing my head in. And like, as a family member, it's so hard, isn't it? Cause you're just like completely powerless over their decisions and actions. And particularly when extreme events happen and then you're just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> just like do something about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, it. I think, I mean, that comes out that whole comes back to that whole thing, which I know you and your organization help with is like, you can't actually help someone until they're actually really ready to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think I was also, I think I was defensive and angry because my mom and dad had been through so much in trying to assist him as well. But I think he's just, um, uh, and I know you, you, cause I, so when I was driving back from this whole debacle, yeah. I was listening to your podcast. My mom sent it to me uh, there you go. <laughs> and I found it so, um, refreshing because it was a very similar situation. Like I'm very lucky, lucky to be born into a family that, you know, we went to a good school, had yeah. food to eat, like got to play soccer, had supportive parents that worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and so from the outside, it's like, well, there was, what is the, the cause of this um, addiction? 100%. But I think it's a whole number of things. And, and like, you know, only the person that's struggling with substance abuse knows truly what's causing it. Yeah. And sometimes like, it's funny, right? You know how you said, oh, you, you feel like you're not, you weren't like a good support in that moment. It's interesting, right? That's one thing that I always tell people is like, even though people are obviously not themselves when they're, you know, under the influence of drugs and alcohol or caught up in addiction or whatever, it doesn't mean that you, you have to like baby them and, and talk to them like, you know, they're not a human. <laughs> mm. um, and, and sometimes actually just letting your emotion out and telling them sort of how it is or talking to them like you would talk to any other person in that situation helps them. You know what I mean? Because it just kind of like breaks through the madness and the denial. It's, it's funny. I, I can remember with my mum when she just kind of candidly spoke to me a couple of times, they were the times where it actually made a difference for me, you know? Um, that doesn't mean that you have to go and scream at people every time mm. you see them and it'll help them. But what it just did cuts she say? Through the, well, I think for me, like her not holding back her emotion, that was probably the thing. Not that she would like yell at me, but she would say things to me like, and she spoke to, you know, other people that had been through addiction, uh, sorry, other family members that had had their kids go through addiction. And she sort of learned a few things on how to talk to me, but she definitely wouldn't hold back on the emotion. And that was the thing that would like cut through me. So she would say like, you know, like Jack, I really fucking love you. You're driving me insane though. Like, you know, I can't fucking deal with this anymore. Like what? And like that would make, then would make me feel like, Oh fuck, what am I doing? And that was the stuff that kind of pushed me towards wanting to get help because, you know, I could see that I was like hurting everyone. So it's sort of interesting how it works, you know? Um, mm. And, and sometimes that's the stuff that actually pushes people over the edge where most people think like, Oh, I've got to just like tiptoe around them, you know, not really tell them how it is. And, and then you just kind of fall into this sandpit of mm. denial, you know? So mm. really interesting. So um how much of like your past experience with your brother's like addiction? Cause I imagine as you explained over the years in your relationship, there was like so many ups and downs, like did that make it hard as well to kind of talk to him in that specific moment or just, just all around. And how do how have you felt over the years about, yeah, watching your, your brother go through all of this? Yeah. I think the hardest thing for me, and I feel like this is something that a lot of families will identify with and I'm sure my, my, mom and my dad each um experience is when there's a window of hope when there's a window of opportunity you feel hope 
Yes. And then, and that hope is so intoxicating. Yeah. And, um, and it's really hard not to, to pin all of your, your wants and, um, and, and forget about the fears and, and, and often that hope is disappointed. And, yeah. and I think that was what was the hardest thing over the last couple of years, seeing um, my brother go through other rehab stints. And I think, you know, we glorify it. We talk about rehab. So um, on such a top level in the media, yeah, um, like there's so little detail about it. And then there's also the inaccessibility and the whole thing, which is just a whole other episode. Um, but I, yeah, I felt like um, until I'd watched my brother go through several stints in rehab, I thought it was like a cure. It's like, oh, you just go in once and yeah. that's all okay. But it's yeah. obviously not that at all. Yeah. Um, and a huge, long process. I think the average is like seven times going into, is that right? I think I think so. I think so. And that's the thing, like, I think you're really right. Like, and it's conversations that I've had a lot, stuff that I've learned by, meeting people that are sort of smarter than me and, and, you know, do the research around this stuff. But yeah, like the, I think you're right. Like the expectations around rehab is like, if we just get him into rehab, everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and most of the time it's kind of this whole journey and, and process um, Mm -hmm. in, in dealing with it. So to kind of deal with that stuff over the years, did you ever like, engage with like any sort of like family support services or how did you find that as a family member yourself just trying to find help for you on how to deal with this stuff so I kind of ended up just distancing myself from the whole situation because I mean when it started to get bad I was in my early 20s and so I was just like fuck it I'm gonna uni I'm out of here I'm traveling whatever I'm gonna do my own thing yeah um and then when he went into 180 TC which is the uh rehab center which is uh receives a lot of funding from well some funding from some significant funding I would say from Hillsong yeah um when those when those opportunities happened, I would give it my all and be like, okay, I'm gonna do everything that I can now that I know that this is has potential. And so the only way I could see him in those times was like to go to Hillsong. Um yeah. and and all of the people from that uh rehab center were cordoned off in the specific area in <laughs> the uh hall a concert hall that's what it was all right um and so I couldn't really get any like one-on-one time with him and I think but so I would kind of put on put in all this enthusiasm and get all this hope and then you then it would kind of slowly fall through once he came out and I think that's one of the flaws of some rehab centers is that there's no um outgoing support like there's I feel like from from what I've heard from my brother and what I've seen in mm. some of the ones he's been to, it's like uh, there's so much support and and routine and activities and 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 teachings and theory and everything through that period. But then once you're out, it's like, well, obviously you're just going to go back to your same group of friends, yeah. Um, and your like you know your social network, um, and. I perceive having not gone through it myself, but it seems like that's one of the flaws of, of some of the rehab centers in Australia. What are your thoughts on? Yeah. Like a hundred percent. It's just like, it's, um, I feel bad because I never want like professionals that particularly like from the public system that like work in the space to feel like, you know, I'm shitting on them, but it's so crap. Like, (laughs) But I don't think it's the people like I was looking to this last weekend. It's the way it's funded. It's the way it's organized. And I was looking at some figures and it's like, there are, well, it's like two, there's like 593 public publicly funded rehab centers. Everyone who's listening to this should fact check it because I'm taking the numbers off the top of my head. Um, (laughs) But, um, and, but then while that was able to support something like 200,000 people, I'm not going to say the number. The main one was there was 500,000 people that were not able to be treated each year. Yeah. And that to me is um, a systematic issue. It's not. And also like even uh, there was one report done by 14 uh, drug affiliated uh, organizations 
Uh, and they said that also staffing is an issue because it's insecure employment. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it's definitely, I think it's, it's just how we structure uh, uh, rehabilitation support in Australia. A hundred percent. I just don't well, think we do enough for it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, so to put it into context with context for everyone, because I'm not much good on the numbers, even though I look at all that stuff, I forget it all the time. But um, I keep referring to this because I think it just puts it into context. We had um, Professor Alison Ritter on the show a couple of shows back. And so she does all the modeling, not all the modeling, I shouldn't say all the modeling. She does modeling um, around the drug and alcohol treatment system. Um, and she she said to me in that podcast show and then followed up with me and sent me some stats that um, the total investment estimated or pretty close in AOD treatment is 1 billion, um, which is 1% of the healthcare budget (laughs) um, all over Australia. So that it's just like, it's fuck all basically. (laughs) Also, according to this report, it's not um, evenly just distributed. It's funneled in. Yeah. And so that often leaves out regional and rural communities where there are huge issues with substance abuse. A hundred percent. 100%. 100%. Oh, fucks me off so much. <laughs> I was going to say, like, like if, if you can, if you don't mind, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but, like, yeah, what you sort of alluded to it just with what we're talking about just before, but what what was your experience with, yeah, the treatment centres, just as a family member engaging with it? And, you know, you mentioned even when, which is not directly related to alcohol and drug treatment, but still in that sort of whole health space, you're calling all the different hotlines and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Like, is it just like a pretty uh, hopeless thing when you're ringing around and and trying to get help? Yeah. Well, I think because, because of this issue with so many people needing support and so Mm. few resources and so few, when when it comes down to it, just beds available, it's kind of like hitting a brick wall over and over again. And I had one moment, which um, is in, this podcast episode where I was and I also have videos because I was going to make a short kind of doco on, a, on about how families deal with drug addiction that until would be amazing it became well, but I was going to do this in last year in the pandemic but it just uh, uh I, it just got too personal and it yeah. just got too hard to do and I had to um back down from it but uh I feel yeah I had this one moment when I was pitching to this uh uh caseworker and because he said to me why should I let your brother in over anyone else like there are so many people waiting to get into a bed Mm -hmm. if he's been through rehab before why should he be the one who gets it over someone else who hasn't been who hasn't had the opportunity before (laughs) which is a, a valid point um and but I had to just realize like well he's just been diagnosed with HIV this is like a hugely personally impactful um diagnosis he needs medical support and he needs psychological support and and this is potentially a more valuable uh window to capitalize on than any other that he's had yeah and what what response did you get it was actually it was really nice the guy was like it disarmed him and he was like well he's lucky to have you and that yeah. was um that was really nice but he's like but also he has to be the one to call so if yeah. he calls then so, and it's I think that's when a uh, hard when it comes to family members with um with people that they love who are struggling with addiction is you're trying to do everything that you can to help them and you want to do what you know they can't like I don't think my brother would have had the capacity to be able to pitch like that at the time yeah. and be like, this has happened and that's happened and this is why it's worth doing. Um, and yeah, but then even though your family members have, uh, may, and maybe they have more of the financial capacity to be able to support, but um, sometimes it's just like the, the system won't allow it. Yeah. And can I ask, was that through like a public service or was that like? That was a- private. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so you couldn't even get a bed in a private Mm-mm. service. Yeah. yeah. And I've called so many. I'm like in 2018, I must have called 20. Um, at, yeah. And just like ringing around and all over Australia. And it's just. Yeah. 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 And did you, have you found, I'm, I'm just interested to know because I actually don't have so much of a great idea about kind of the split and stuff, but 
you mentioned that, you know, the one that you went to visit him in where he was like cordoned off in a hall um, at some stage was like a Hillsong, predominantly like a Hillsong one. Have you found that most of the centres have been like religion based or uh, like? So I did a story about um, about uh, rehab centres that were uh, funded in at least in some part by uh uh, religious organizations a couple of years ago for hack and from memory again this needs to be fact-checked but it was 50 percent of them were received funding from um religious affiliate religious organizations yeah. um and that was and, and at least when it came to 180tc the the religion was such a huge part of the rehabilitation <laughs> and that's great for people who um who are religious or 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 want to kind of move Explore into yes yeah. yeah, to faith but i it just doesn't work for everyone and also if you're going to church as your regulation for healing and then you finish that rehab you finish that rehab stint and then you leave and you don't have the bus to take you to church every week mm. how are you going to access that supportive community um you don't have the people teaching you the theology and there's just so many to me from the outside inconsistencies and i think it's unfair that we um that we funnel faith and religion into uh into rehab centers and to people who are vulnerable yeah yeah that's a good point <laughs> Um, and I think it's not, and I know the intentions are so good of those places as well, because they want to save these people. Uh, they want to save them in faith and they want to save their health. Yeah. Um, but it just doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. And it's like, I'm glad that you're kind of able to be honest about it and talk about it because again, like just for everyone listening, this is not to, um, like, so I know all of this, but I, it's kind of my intention about for the podcast is to have people's real stories and experiences on from a range of different perspectives, just so that people listening, you know, hopefully a little bit like you were on that crazy drive back on the highway can kind of just get a bit of an idea about how to navigate the space and some of this stuff from everyone's experience, you know, and it's just, this is the thing. It's, it's kind of such a strange I think my personal view is, is because drugs and alcohol are so like stigmatized, mainly drugs, but you know, alcohol, like um, abuse, if you want to call it that is so stigmatized in, you know, society. It just like, it's not focused like alcohol and drug treatment isn't like heavily focused on and it's getting better, but and then there's just so many like weird things that happen in the system, <laughs> you know, that people have to like kind of put up with. And I've had heaps of mates as well that have done religious based programs that just like, no offense to anyone listening to this, that's religious, but that just like could not give a fuck about the religion, but they're just like desperate, <laughs> you mm. know, and they go mm. and they just like, sit there and the whole time that they're trying to get help for like this internal turmoil that's going on inside of them they're mm. like trying to like battle against these like religious kind of teaching yeah it's just a funny strange strange it's thing. also a hugely uh, it's a strange cultural experience if you haven't been brought up in a you know in, in avenues of faith like a religious school or anything and then yeah. suddenly you're going to church every week and and having like bible <laughs> study in the morning that's a huge thing to get used to along with um, suddenly not being able to take a substance that has your body has become used to. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's um, yeah, it's, it's really strange. So like, can I ask, um, is how's, how's your brother going now? Like you mentioned that he pushed to get into the rehab after this, this time, is he, is he going okay? And, um, yeah, how are things? Yeah, I think so. He went to oh my gosh, I can't remember which one it was. Is it St. John of God? I can't remember. Maybe yeah, they're pretty, one. they're pretty big. That would sound yeah. right. Yeah. Um, or another one. It was in the hill somewhere. Um, and it was one of the things. Sorry, just going back to like yeah, dealings sure. with rehab centers. Um, when he his most recent um I don't want to call it a stint, but his most recent experience in a rehab center, it was so different. It wasn't religious based at all. Yeah. 
Um, and he was learning a lot about meditation and um, what was it? Like all these different therapy, like dealing yeah, with anxiety yeah. and, and social situations. And he was just, when I visited him, he was just a different person. Like he was himself. He yeah. was just like more of himself and he was less frustrated and he was less angry and he was like eating well and like Amazing. his skin was better. And um, I'm going off course. Oh my gosh. What was the question? I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. That's okay. It's good. It's good to hear that things turn around. Well, that's what oh, I was yeah. asking. But I was then, asking how's it going? Yeah. Yeah. So then, so we finished that and then luckily he, so we met someone in, um, uh, in the center that, uh, he ended up working with. And I think that's been yeah. a real uh, 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 grounding experience for him, having mm -hmm. people to answer to, like a purpose, like a job to go to every day. Um, I think lockdown has been really hard for him. I think lockdown yeah. is hard for everyone, let yeah. alone when you're um, changing your own life. Um, and I know it's been... I think it's been hard for him, but I think it's it's slowly getting better, which is heartening. Um, yeah. And one thing that was really important for me to highlight in this episode that I did was that um, it's not just like the happy ending. It's like, oh, well, now he's fixed. Now he went to rehab and everything's okay. It's like, yeah. it's a, as you know, it's like a long, it, it doesn't just tie up all the loose ends and then it's fine. It's like an ongoing and long kind of uh, uh, experience to have to manage. And that's what I was going to ask you, right? So you went through this whole like pretty kind of intense experience where, you know, he's got this diagnosis and he's called you and you've been through this whole journey running around um, trying to get him into a place. He gets into a place, you, you get some relief, but in the back of your head, you've been through it, whatever, however many times before, your kind of expectations are adjusted. Like how does then one go and deal with, like all your emotions, like how have you gone in like processing that? Like, ha have you done anything? Did you just kind of go back to normal life or yeah. What was that like? Yeah. It was strange because I kind of um, packed him up. Like he took his bag from the Gold Coast and then I drove him down to Sydney and I had two weeks in Sydney. Um, and luckily I had my, my partner there like here as well. And that was a, a huge support at the time but then I had to go back up to Queensland and so I yeah. left him in Sydney and went back to normal life um, wow. and that was just but I've done so much therapy <laughs> <laughs> I've done so much therapy and I love my therapist and she's great and I spoke to her a lot after that yeah, and during yeah. it as well like I went I think I dropped him after this 32 hour trip through all these closed roads and this like weather disaster and crashes and all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I dropped him at this, at the Kirkton road center. And then my dad luckily was able to come as well, even though he'd been evacuated from yep. Windsor and um, <laughs> I left him there. And then I went straight to my therapist <laughs> and just like, overloaded her <laughs> um but and yeah and I was I was shitty at the time I was really angry because he also yeah. he slept the entire 32 hours and <laughs> um and probably because like his body was like suddenly recovering and because of yeah. the shock of like getting that diagnosis and um and of so and and of suddenly leaving the Gold Coast like the, there's huge huge things to deal with. Of course you would sleep for 32 hours, but I, like my initial reaction was like, fuck you. <laughs> I just drove you 32 hours from Queensland. I left my job. Like, and yeah. it's just like you get, and um, I I was recently listening to uh, Rick Morton's book, A uh, Hundred Years of Dirt, which I highly recommend awesome. for people who um, have an addict in the family. And he, I've never read it. I've got to read it. Oh, my God. It's amazing. It's so good. It's beautifully written. It's really cool. And it talks really specifically about, um, about also how class and, and money and poverty can like, and, and the, the, a deeply installed class system in Australia uh, 
kind of puts people on the back foot and yeah. he had a brother with an ice addiction and this is one reason why I did this podcast episode because he mentioned one day in passing on a 7 a.m episode that he had this brother with an ice addiction and it I was just listening when I was around the kitchen and it stopped me in my tracks because I'd never heard someone else in the media talk about how an issue that they cover impacts them personally wow and so um and I found that just so reassuring and, and heartening. And But anyway, coming back to 100 Years of Dirt, he talks about some of his brother's, like, uh, treatment of his mother. And yeah. Rick Morton says, is like, sometimes I just wanted him to go to jail. Like, it would, it would yeah. provide my family some relief. And I think um, that comes from frustration and those, like, elements of hope that are disappointed yeah when you just want you just want that family member to be okay yeah i find it so interesting right that because so what you just kind of detailed then when you were saying that you know you heard him say it kind of in passing on the radio or on a podcast or whatever it was um and it stopped you in your tracks and you were like you never heard someone speak like that before and have the same experience um it's interesting, right? Because that's what people that are going through drugs and alcohol often say as well. They're always like that. And that was the thing for me. It was like hearing somebody else's wasn't so much their story. It was more just like the feelings and thought processes surrounded it, surrounding it just kind of blew me away. I was like, fucking hell. Like there's other people out there that think and feel like me and all that stuff. So I just find it super interesting how the two kind of match up like that, you know, and how that kind of lived experience, shared story, mm. um, living experience, people are calling it really just like connects the dots for people and helps them, helps them to kind of get through. So can I, can I ask like out of this whole process, not only this kind of one massive intense experience that you've had, but just over the years, like what have you sort of learned about addiction and what, and, and what sort of lessons has it taught, taught you about how to just kind of manage day to day and go about things and, you know, all that kind of corny stuff? <laughs> um, for myself or for like, if you, if as both, both. Yeah. Okay. As, as a, probably as a family member. Yeah. Um, well, when I was trying to make this short doco thing about how people deal with addiction in the family, I called a, um, a another hotline <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was a for- hotline's helpful do you think <laughs> yeah. um in this instance it was like I don't know I have so many thoughts about that because at the moment I'm writing an article about the amount of money that goes into uh uh s- like hotline services and uh, in support of mental health dealing with a pandemic but actually it's just so much more complex than that and there's yeah anyway yeah, yeah. A hotline, a hotline I mean, is not gonna solve your problem yeah I don't <laughs> think so I mean not on my Sunday when I was like ringing around just trying to get someone to help yeah. um but this one particular day I called a hotline uh it was like family and family and friends of uh people with uh, drug issues or something yeah and um and I spoke and I spoke to this amazing man. He was so cool. And he said to me, um, I was trying to look at it as an interview. I was like, so what do you tell families if um, they suddenly have, uh, <laughs> you know, a family member that is, you know, comes with a substance abuse issue and they're feeling frustrated. They don't know what to do. Da, da, da. And he's like, and he said, you have to figure out what your own boundaries are. Yeah. And you have to be upfront with your, that person about them and be like, you know, it may be like, you don't want to give them any money, but you, they can stay in your house whenever they need, if they yeah. need support, or it may be that you are happy to give them money and they can still um, use whatever substance they use, but just as long as it's this or whatever, and you decide on your boundaries and you tell that person and you stick with them. That's and really good advice. It was great advice. And so when um, last year, when my brother rocked up on my doorstep in the pandemic uh, and I'd had that conversation, I said to him, it's like, no drugs in my house. Um, and but and I, I want you to just be able to like, eat healthy and just tell, tell me what's going on. And yep. then like everything else I'm cool with, like I'll give you money if you need money, um, but I just don't want you taking drugs in my house because it's my safe space and I, and everything else is crashing and burning in the world so I need <laughs> the house needs to be a safe secure place um and then what I've learned about 
what I've learned about addiction is I just think we have such a such un, cruel is distolerance intolerance for people um with substance abuse challenges in Australia um and I think the reasons are, are really complex yeah um and I think it's given me a lot of compassion for my brother whereas I thought it's like oh well we had the same upbringing and like so why does he have these issues and I don't but he, there may well be you know heaps of things like I had there are there's shit in in my past that I like could easily make me fly off the handle and same with anyone yeah. and I just think all of these um all of our challenges come from like a, far more complex issues than we that we perceive and discuss yeah what do you think what's the professional thought on that like is that true or is that wrong no I I love that and I um so so yeah I, I think I think one of the big problems that we have and the more that I've spoken to kind of like public health professionals is is the challenge is the complexity right because you know if you're doing like public health messaging or trying to I don't know get funding for services it's it's really or just anything like if you're marketing a product right you're all like humans just want to like say this is the thing that explains it and this is what we need this is the thing we need to do <laughs> and we just apply that to everybody and it's going to work for like 96 percent of the people and i think that's the hard thing about addiction is that it's it's so individualized and so different for everyone that there is like no one thing, um, mm. which then makes it like incredibly hard to develop. Yeah. Like solutions that cater to a large per percentage of people. Like, again, it's, a, it's like a structural problem, you know, with the, with the mechanisms in the way that we um, fund treatment and services and stuff to support people because, you know, if, if that individualized approach is expensive and it doesn't fit mm. into into value for money frameworks and stuff mm. like that, you know, and mm. a hotline seems like the answer. <laughs> and, yeah, totally. <laughs> and I also, I think our social communities are such a strong part of it. Like if I, like my friends are, if I, if something happened in my life and then there was, and that, and I was not supposed to go and be friends with them anymore because it was causing me damage I don't I don't know if I could do that it's yeah. so incredibly hard and particularly when you go like you do have to like go to rehab or have something like very like um impactful on your life it's so hard not to go back to your friends and if those friends are people that are also caught up in the same addictions or challenges fuck that's just I don't know how you fix that a hundred percent so and and that's the interesting thing so in terms of addiction like it's changed for me over the over the years but i just think where we have to get to with the conversation is a little bit like physical health right so you know uh i i think it's like a spectrum right and anyone could kind of i, I think we need to almost stop calling it like addiction as stupid mm. and crazy as that sounds and start referring to it as like addictive patterns or like mm. like habits that you know, can really kind of get out of control. Um, because like, from my experience, most people that I talk to, yes, there is like that biochemical element that people have. And for sure, there's probably something that's wired into our genetics. Um, but largely, most people kind of describe some sort of um, like internal soothing that is going on with the drug and alcohol use, right? And there's something mm. kind of more driving it. And I think, you know, yeah, we start, we, I've said this heaps of times, but we have to start having the conversation um, like we do with physical health. So if it's cold outside in Melbourne, like it is tonight, um, you wouldn't go outside without a jumper on because you'd probably catch a cold, you know? So like mm. if you're having a stressful week at work and an argument with your partner and you're struggling with some financial issues, mm. maybe you shouldn't have a beer that night because it could potentially kind of fester into something more, you know? So yeah. And I that's think, such yeah. a cultural change as well. Cause like we 100%. all do that. Yeah. It's like you have a long day at work. Maybe you come home and, and like have a glass of wine and it's like a similar form of relief, but it's just a different, more socially acceptable one. That's right. So being through all these experiences, 
like, what would you like to see kind of change? Because my whole thing with this um, is that like, I don't know. I feel like I'm a bit of a rebel without a cause sometimes, but you know, like it's, it's um, I just think the whole thing just needs like some fresh people in like yourself, like just people that aren't meant to be experts that are just looking at it from a different frame of mind that can kind of disrupt it and change it a little bit because they've had the experiences. Um, Yeah. So what would you say needs to, needs to change? You've kind of alluded to it a little bit, I think, but yeah. yeah, I think we need so much more funding into support. I think also, I think Australia's discussion around drugs is very conservative um, yeah. and it's very, and, you know, we have a history of a war on drugs and, and just say no. And, you know, and, and like Australia's culture is surrounded by drinking for fun and taking drugs for fun. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that don't get substance abuse issues that's right. And that's fine and good. And so I think um I think our conversation around addiction needs to change and I think there needs to be so much more money to go into support and to be able to yeah support the staff that work in it and to create after support and hopefully I'm sure and I know your program is like very strongly focused on like a more longer term um whole whole body and and mind and personality kind of treatment yeah treatment healing What's yeah the right word? like and that's <laughs> the thing like treatment it makes you sound like you're going into I know. Yeah. just yeah. like I don't know, help, support, whatever, work out, like, you know, yeah. we all do program. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would I would love to see the conversation around drugs change, even when it comes down to like pill testing, we should have in Australia when festivals, if they ever come back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, we should make it safer. There is a um, safe injecting clinic in King's Cross and I don't think they've had one person ever die there. Yeah. And I think we just need to make drug safer and we need to make the support for people who need it far easier to access yeah so much easier to access because then potentially that could uh make those windows of opportunity you could capitalize on them with a lot more success yeah a hundred percent and then save a lot of pain and a lot of money well that's the thing that that that's the big argument i i personally think that's the only way that it's going to shift initially uh like for political purposes right is that we need some really kind of smart financial modeling which is already there i must add by the way but we kind of need some professional tell me about the financial modeling like well well, there's all this really good like evidence and research and i'll have to go and find the papers and stuff offline that show like the severe impacts like second and third flow on consequences of alcohol and drug use onto Mm. like the whole healthcare system and Mm. the burden that it has on the healthcare system in primary care, emergency war, you know, all of that. And then the flow and effect that it has in society in general, um, you know, not hugely in crime, but just again, like community resources mm. that go to it, you know, um, and then obviously the emotional tax and mm. personal financial burden. So, but that research is definitely there, but we need, we need like some really kind of clever, um, campaigning people and, and pitch people to be able to, yeah, swing the public, um, the public mm. information and get get the public involved and on board you know um mm. and and that's what i was going to say to you that's my secret hope not that i uh wish anybody like yourself to kind of go through these um circumstances but i think you know it's going to come from people that have personal experience uh and don't necessarily come from the space that do hold interesting positions and have other skills in journalism and media and stuff like that to create compelling stories and um information and you know articles and stuff that's going to help move the the conversation Mm. in the right direction so Mm. that's my secret hope for you as i've been talking to you (laughs) i hope i I can contribute in some way it was nice to be able to make this uh when i made this podcast episode i had so many people actually other family members reach out and be like i had i had because i i'm pretty candid in it um with all of the We'll make sure we link to that show as well in the notes. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, and it just really surprised me how many people reached out and were like, oh, I hadn't heard someone, you know, because you hear about 
um, like you said at the beginning of this show, you hear about addiction from the perspective of an addict or like the system or whatever, but so rarely from family members. That's right. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're often the support system that's trying the hardest to get to help that person. Well, as we've just heard from your story, you, like, you know, people might go to rehab for six weeks or whatever it is out of uh, 12 months, or they might be engaged with some sort of outreach thing where they see someone for an hour in a day, an hour in the day. But then, you know, the family members just there for the other 23 hours in the day trying to deal with it, you know? Mm. So yeah, it's. Um, and then there's also flow and effects for that. Like when I was down here, uh, like my partner, I was divulging everything to my partner and they were dealing with it and like other friends and then they were stressing out and it's 100%. just like, it's an emotional uh, ripple on effect. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Hey, that was awesome, mate. I, I really appreciate um, you're coming on and yeah, just being candid and open about the story because I know it's like, it is a hard thing to tell, like, um, just for anyone to, you know, uh, flesh out those moments in your life, but particularly, you know, as you said to me before we were recording, cause it's like not particularly your story, it's your brother's story, but it's your, but, but that's the thing I wanted to say to you. It actually is your story as well, because as you said, you're going through it, you know? So that's the interesting yeah. thing. I do want to um, mention quickly that I really appreciate that my brother gave, had the generosity to give me the permission to tell it. Like, mm. I think mm. it's, 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 it's hugely generous and I'm absolute off of him for, um, for allowing, like for not, for having no control at all over someone else kind of telling yeah. a portion of your story. And yeah, it means a lot to me. Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming on. We'll speak again soon. I'm sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a delight. <laughs> no worries. Peace, everybody. Hey, YouTube watcher. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you and your family are doing well in these extraordinary times. I also want to ask you, can you please subscribe and hit the bell notification? We're really launching into our YouTube channel this year and want to build our audience so that we can progress through the ranks and basically get the message of recovery and hope and change and all that good stuff out there to as many people as we can. So we would love it if you would consider it and subscribe and help us out. Also for anyone seeking help um, and information and resources, we've put together a 100% free online course that you can access, link in the description. Um, so if you are looking for help, hope that you know is something that can help you out as well. Um, until next time, see you in the next video. Peace.